hello. Um, okay, that was a great introduction, so I feel like I need to um, manage expectations a bit. I've, I've caught the office illness that's been going around, and I'm, I, you know, there's been occasions today and yesterday that my, my face has felt like it's been, you know, full of like an orgy of bees or something. It's been, it's been horrible. The, um, Christian was really kind to take me to a, a pharmacy, and he, um, he bought me some of this. I, I don't know what it is, but I've been taking it. All of the instructions are in German, so I don't know how much I'm supposed to have been taking. I mean, I actually understand that word. Uh, it says anaphylactic shock. So um, <laughs> at no point in my presentation do I, do I act out anaphylactic shock. So if you see me having an anaphylactic shock, I really am having an anaphylactic shock. And if someone could call me an ambulance, that would be excellent. So. I know all the speakers, uh, we, we've all been sort of doing little uh, polls of the audience. So if you don't write JavaScript as a big part of your job, could, could you stand up? Because it's quite difficult for me to see. So stand up if you don't do JavaScript as a big part of your talk, a big part of your job even, not talk, I'm, I'm the talk. Cool, OK, interesting. Stay, stay, there, for, no, stay, stay there for just a moment. I, thank you very much, yep, OK. Um, so yeah, this is reusable code for, for good or for awesome. We're going to look at what makes reusable code reusable. Um, I'm seeing people sit down. I'm not happy about that. Um, <laughs> we're we're going to look at the API and, and its style, uh, and how it's presented, and how you can help users get creative with your code. And it is quite code heavy. So my theory is you can't fall asleep if you're standing up. So <laughs> thank you very much. But first, some introductions. So yeah, I, I'm Jack Archibald. I come from uh, the northwest of England. And as you can see, e even at this Zoom level, Google chooses not to draw any labels anywhere near where I'm actually from. <laughs> but there is actually stuff there. Uh, for instance, there's the Cumberland Pencil Museum, which is a museum all about pencils, which is where you know, our parents would take us uh, as a treat after working down the mines or whatever it is we do. <laughs> it's also home to the city of love, Cockermouth. <laughs> So. There's, I think there's a real sort of innocence in Cumbria. There's a, there's a train station there uh, in a place called Wigton. And even until about five years ago, they did have a sign on the platform. Because it was, it was a really small platform, so a lot of trains just went straight through. And they genuinely have a sign there that says, don't stand too close to the platform edge, or you might get sucked off. Like, oh, for <laughs> crying out loud. Anyway. I, I was sent to London. I was, I, I was sent away. I was sent down to London to the BBC uh, to be domesticated, and that turned me from an uncultured northerner with a poor taste in beer uh, to an uncultured northerner, but with a better taste in beer. That's, that's something I've learned from going around the world. So, at the BBC, I, I was developing uh, Glow, which was a, a kind of library we were using on, on a lot of BBC sites. I left the BBC, and I worked at a creative agency called The Team, uh, and I now work at a startup uh, called Lanyard, which, you know, uh, tracks conferences, you might have used it uh, for this conference. So three very different companies, and, I, and I've been doing JavaScript work in all three. I've designed a lot of APIs over the past few years, and, and some worked and some didn't, and it, it surprised me how difficult it is uh, to get right and how easy it is to get wrong, how many pitfalls there are. The way I see it, there are five elements you must harness and control in order to write good reusable code. Those elements are consistency, flexibility, readability, writability, and kind of useful ability. So as consistency, you know, uh, the power to make your code uh, feel predictable and familiar to your users. Flexibility, the power to let your, your users use your code in ways that you didn't imagine. Readability, can your code be familiar to someone even who isn't uh, used to your API, who they haven't, they haven't read the documentation yet. And writability, having good documentation, make your, your code a joy to, to work with and write with. And kind of useful ability, that's obvious, to create something people actually want to use. And when all of those things are combined, you are captain of adequately reusable JavaScript. <laughs> so, I'll admit it's not the best superhero name in the world. Uh, Marvel have copyright on, two, on most two and three word combinations. You know? But you can't unleash the captain until you've mastered all of these things. So we're going to look at some examples, or meet, meet some uh, arch nemeses, if we're going to keep with the metaphor, uh, and see how code uh, fails or succeeds in, in these things. So we're going to begin where, where most things do, right at the start. So. 
you need to find something worth building. And that can be something people need now or something you anticipate people needing in the future. Or it could just be something existing uh, that you think that you can do better than anyone else. I mean, you know, uh, the iPhone wasn't the first smartphone, Facebook wasn't the first social network, but you know, they were better than everyone else there at the time. It could be an application, something the size of, of Google Maps or, or Google Docs. Or it could be a small component, something to aid with cross-domain uh, commu cross communication. What you create doesn't even need to have a specific use in mind uh, right now. Take the laser, for instance. In the beginning, there was no laser. And then the laser was invented. But, but there wasn't a specific application for it. It was just this <laughs> scientific achievement. You know, so, oh, well done, point of light, mm, you know, slow clap. But then later, many applications were found. You know, we, we see the laser for measuring distances, reading CDs, uh, et cetera, et cetera. There's lots of uses for it. And that can happen with your reusable code as well. You know, you could make a, um, uh, like a video encoder in pure JavaScript, and people are going, well, you know, well done, but pointless. But then maybe someone who's doing stuff with Node.js will you know, really benefit from having, having that kind of code. So for the sake of this presentation, I'm going to look at building a carousel. At the BBC, we were, there was a new design standard came out, and there was a lot of redesigns on a lot of sites. And on one of them, we saw this. Oh, OK, that's fair enough. We got images and text and a couple of buttons. And then as we looked at the rest of the designs, we read this thing had spread like a virus. You know, I, I imagine some of the designers had gone to a, a conference, and they were told that this is the new form of navigation for everything. So they came back to the BBC and, and added it to every one of their sites. So we wanted to create a reusable version of this, rather than all the departments and the BBC creating their own. There wasn't one which existed in the open source world already, certainly not one that covered off um, all the browsers we needed to support or the accessibility requirements we had. So to begin, we started gathering requirements. What we wanted to do is work out uh, what did the thing need to do, what, uh, what were its, um, its features. To do that, that can mean talking to designers or potential users or just researching similar things. So if you're wanting to write something to make working with Canvas elements easier, then go and have a look at what people are using a Canvas element for. See if there's any commonality that you can, that you can make easier. For the, canvas, uh, for the carousel, we were talking to the designers and asking them, so how does this work? What happens when I press these buttons? To demonstrate the basic features of the carousel that the designers were describing, uh, I've mocked one up. Here's, here's a carousel of people that I don't like very much. So as you can see, there's, there's images and some text underneath, and then there's the two buttons. And when you click the button, it starts moving through, through the rest of the people. When it reaches the end, we can't go past uh, jolly racist Mel Gibson. You, you've reached the end. The button is now disabled. But then if you were to click back, you know, the, the button becomes active. There's a definite start and an end to this carousel, and that's what we heard from some of the designers. But then from some other designers, they said, right, no, on our carousel, even though cheating Formula One driver Fernando Alonso is the first item, you can click back and loop through. Uh, OK, so that's, that's two, uh, two features that we need to capture already. So once we had the basics, what do we do? OK, so you might want to write some code at this point to, to test the feasibility of what you've been asked to create. But generally, the API needs to be um, designed before any implementation. The API and its documentation really are the, the cornerstone of, of reusable code. So Bruce Wayne, he devoted his life to fighting crime when, when his parents were killed. That's his, that's his creation story. I also have a, a kind of creation story. And I'm going to adopt a storytelling position on the stairs for this. If I could have some mood lighting, that would be excellent. <laughs> Thank you. So, OK. <laughs> I was. Um, <laughs> I was, oh, thank you. I, so I was, uh, I was walking through my living room, and, and my mom said to me, hey, there's this TV show coming on TV. Are you interested in watching it? It's on the History Channel. And I was like, hmm, what's, what's it about? Because you know, the History Channel, there's a 95% chance it's about the Egyptians or Hitler, and we were doing that at school, and so I had absolutely no interest in, in that at all. And my mom said, no, no, this show is called Historical Fallacies. And I was like, what, what's a fallacy? Because I'm about 13 years old at this point. And she said, well, it's a, it's, a, it's a misconception people have, something that they believe is true, but is actually false. So they're going to be looking at things and debunking things that people think is true. And I thought, well, that sounds quite interesting. So I, I sat, down, sat down to watch it, because I kind of like the whole um, you know, debunking myths kind of thing. But no, there'd been a mistake in the TV guide. The show was actually called Historical Fallacies. <laughs> so there I was with my mother, 
watching a show basically about cocks. <laughs> they had stone ones, clay ones, metal ones, painted ones. They certainly had the variety. And I sat there watching quite a lot of it, kind of sort of gripping my seat, going, just please debunk something. What, what is with this? Why, why? This is not what I was sold. So because of that, I vowed to take a stand against bad documentation because no one should have to watch a documentary about Cox with their mum. <laughs> so back in the land of code, the better the API, the, the more the user will, will get out of your code, and a bad API may hide or distract from, from the features. When you see those websites, like a, 100 things you didn't know about Photoshop, and th those sites are great, but the reason you didn't know those 100 things is because Photoshop was really bad at telling you about them. We don't want to create an API that's really bad at hiding its, its uh, it's really good at hiding its best features. And APIs are also really difficult to change. Uh, a large API change is usually backwards incompatible, and users might not appreciate that change even if it is for the better, because they're used to the old way. Take a look at these buttons and have a quick think about what those buttons might do. It, you might think this is, this is easy because they're, they're labeled. These buttons do absolutely nothing. They're on the London Underground trains, but when, when an underground train reaches a station, the doors just all open automatically, all of them. These buttons do absolutely nothing. As Londoners, we, we can tell who the tourists are on the tube because they're the ones sort of jabbing the button when it gets to the station. Right? <laughs> Tourist, uh, yeah. This button, however, this is, this is a button on the Docklands Light Railway, which is a kind of extension to the underground, but it's, it's overground, you know. And I used to live on an area of London which was serviced by, by these trains. This button does work, and you have to press it if you're wanting to get off the train. So I, w I was traveling home one day, and, and there was this couple uh, standing in front of me, and the train got to the, the station, uh, my station, and presumably theirs as well, and the train stops. This button lights up, uh, flashing, starts beeping, uh, and this guy's girlfriend, she, she reached over to, to press the button, and he stopped her and went, no, 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 the doors open automatically. And I thought, well, I kind of need to get off here, but this looks entertaining, so <laughs> let's see what happens. And so obviously the, the button flashes, noises are made, and then they stop, and the train just carries on to its next destination. And he got a look like he was never going to get sex ever again, or certainly, <laughs> certainly not from her. But that's not his fault, right? He, he's, been, uh, he's learned from this interface which is broken on, on the underground, and then when he was faced with one which was actually better, one which worked properly, it caused him a problem. So we're going to offer the, the user a function to, to create a carousel. Not all reusable code requires an API. You can just enhance something that's on the page already, but we need a little bit more flexibility, so we're, we're going to create a function. But that begs the question, where are we going to put that function? So there are a few choices, uh, the global scope, we can use a namespace, we can enhance an existing object, or we can make some kind of library plugin. We need our function to be accessible from, from the global scope somehow, because we need, we need a way in. But just cluttering the global scope isn't, isn't the way forward, because then two things are going to clash and one of them's going to break. It reminds me of when I was, uh, the, the house that I grew up in, in, in our garden, we had um, a sand pit, a, a sandbox. And to me, that's what it was. it was. It was for building sandcastles in. However, uh, the cats had a different, different opinion. The, it was the cat toilet. And, and that was it. The, the scope was polluted. It was no longer useful for what I... Because you can't make sandcastles out of cat shit by definition. <laughs> I made some stunning cat shit castles, but not sandcastles. So it's a no for the global scope. What about namespaces? Well, so namespaces are good at grouping similar things together. There are no namespaces in JavaScript, but objects behave in a similar way. So I've got jtoys.carousel. OK, and then I can add an accordion, but I've only made one entry into the global scope, so things aren't being polluted very much. Namespaces, they can also contain other namespaces. You can get multiple levels of organization. So here I've got two UI elements in a sub namespace, UI, and then I've got like a, a thing to search Flickr in a, in a net namespace. This kind of organization can go too far. We need to be careful not to over-organize. Some, a bit of code like this, if we're only ever going to make UI um, elements, or if we only currently have UI elements, this is too much organization. Some APIs end up looking like a trophy shelf with only one trophy. You know, there's more organization than things to organize. And OK, it's kind of in, in anticipation for other things, but at the moment, it, it's just more confusing to the user. So just organize when necessary, because you can always alias for backwards compatibility. 
in QUnit, they had a function. This is a, a JavaScript unit testing framework by the jQuery guys. They had a function called, called same, which would compare two objects and their properties. It was kind of a deep comparison. CommonJS came along sometime later, and they defined this same behavior, uh, called it deep equal. And the QUnit guys thought, well, this is a standard, so, so we should adopt it. And they renamed to deep equal. Obviously, that would break loads of existing code. So they just made an alias. It was as simple as that. They've got that in their code, and now everything continues to work, but they've adopted a new standard. So yeah, namespaces seem to be working. What about um, extending existing objects? In JavaScript, all objects can be modified, and that's, that's a good thing. So I could have a function that took an array of numbers and added them all together. But if this function always takes uh, arrays, we could just add that method onto the array object. So you know, I've got all of my numbers, dot sum at the end. And it's, it's, you know, there's less writing there, and it, it, it kind of feels right. It reads really well. So you can create kind of sexy looking readable code. One example which is kind of taken from Rails is you can have six dot weeks dot from now. And dates are horrible to work with in, in any language, but this, this kind of syntax, it's, it's instantly readable. It's brilliant. Very easy to implement. On the number prototype, we'd say, OK, our number objects need to have a weeks method, which would create a date object. And the date object would have a from now method, which would add the current date to it. And there you go. That's, it's very easy to do. So what's the catch? What if two independent bits of JavaScript, they both add like the, a sum method to a number, but it does something slightly different, or it has another parameter? One's going to override the other, but all of the code's going to be using the, the same one. And one of them's going to get something it doesn't expect, and everything's going to blow up. It's happened before as well. On the document object, we used to have get elements by, well, we still have uh, get elements by class name, uh, and we could add a, put a class name in. This was introduced by prototype JS and, and base two. So, you know, we could, it returns an array, so we can do a slice on it afterwards and, and those kind of operations. But then it became part of HTML5, and it returns uh, a live node list, as you can see there. So a node list doesn't have a slice method, so already things were sort of being, uh, there was a difference between the prototype implementation and the standard one. But also, it's a live node list. So that means if I have uh, comments of, of length two, then add another comment to the page, just with a bit of jQuery like this, comments.length is now three. And we can't, we can't emulate that. We can't emulate that with JavaScript, um, certainly not in Internet Explorer. So now the version the libraries are giving us is not the same as the standard. One thing's going to expect the standard. One thing's going to expect the prototype behavior. Something's going to fail. Prototype and base two, they had to drop their function uh, and break backwards compatibility to do that. The golden rule really is just don't mess with objects you don't own because you don't know what's going to happen in the future. You don't know what new specs are going to come out. So for me, uh, Existing objects, enhancing them doesn't work. But some objects, they actually invite you to enhance them. And that's where library plugins come in. It's very similar to, to what we saw before, extending core types. But there's less risk, because it's, it's a kind of you've already got a contract with the library. That, that's what they're expecting you to do. We're going to look at jQuery as a, as a JavaScript library. It's already been mentioned. It's the most popular one. I, I should stress that I mean jQuery, the JavaScript library, not to be confused with Jake Weary, who's a small-time American actor. <laughs> um, he doesn't accept bug reports no matter what time of night you call him. He was very rude. He was very, very rude. So we could add a carousel method to, to jQuery like this, and that, it's really simple to do. We just do jQuery.fn.carousel, add the function. That can seem a little bit magic, but jQuery and dollar, they're the same object, exactly the same, reference to the same thing in memory. And jQuery.fn is the same as jQuery.prototype. So it's exactly the same as when we were adding things onto the number object and the date object before. And because of that, we can still have the collision problems. If you've got two plugins adding the same methods, uh, you know, something's going to break. But the point is that you're in control of that. You're in control of adding those libraries. So you'll, you'll be able to catch when it goes wrong. The browser is never going to add anything to the jQuery object. It's all updating in your control, and you can test that. So yeah, library plugin, that works as well. So which do we pick? It's down to you, really. Well, not completely down to you. Consider the users. What are the users used to? If your potential users are people who know jQuery rather than JavaScript, and there are a lot of those around, then yeah, go the jQuery way, because that's going to be easiest for them. If your users are used to Node.js, or they work with things like UE or Dojo, then do things the more traditional JavaScript way, because that's what they're used to, the namespace method. We're going to continue to look at both, because there's some interesting differences between the two. The important thing is to be consistent. Don't mix and match. So and that's why consistency is one of the really important things we're looking at. And that's, that's difficult. To, to, you need to be consistent not just with, within your own code, but consistent with other code that the, the users might uh, encounter. And that's difficult because inconsistency is everywhere. Take core JavaScript, for example. If I have a string and I want to change it, I can call a method on it like that, too, lowercase. 
if I want to create a particular kind of string, I can use a factory method like, like this. And that's the way dates work, regex, arrays. So you think if I had a number and I wanted to, to round it, I would call a method on it. And if I wanted to create a particular kind of number, I would call it a factory method. But it's, that's not how it works. We have this other object. We've got this math object. And it's, it's quite different to how the, the rest of JavaScript works. Like most of the world's problems, this is caused by Java. Uh, JavaScript deliberately copied the Java style uh, for, for this notation. So consistency with other languages is good, but very few JavaScript developers come from a Java background, so it, it's a kind of pointless thing to do. It's, it's just confusing. Given all this inconsistency, we, we need someone to guide us, a, a kind of a, a master or a, a sensei. This man is Patrick Stewart. I pick Patrick Stewart because his powers of consistency are so strong, he hasn't changed physically in 35 years. <laughs> D don't worry too much about the hair in the first picture. I think it's a wig. So, you know, he's always, he was born bald, you know. When coding, ask yourself, would Patrick Stewart approve of what I'm doing? <laughs> and we'll keep that in mind as, as we move on. So how do we make this work for our carousel? Start with documentation. Always start with the documentation, because things might make sense in your head, but your head doesn't store data in a linear way. And when you explain something to someone, it has to be uh, in a sort of linear fashion. So you want to find out how easy your API is to explain as early as possible before you do any serious work on it. How easy it is to document probably shows you how easy it's going to be for people to use it. And that's why writability is one of the important things that we're wanting from reusable code. Good, clean documentation is so, so rare in code that's intended to be reusable. It's, it's the killer of, of projects. And if your documentation is wrong, little children might end up watching shows about Cox with their mum. And I can't stress how much of an effect that can have on a child's upbringing, OK? It can scar a man. So this is JS Doc, Doc Toolkit. This is how I would document uh, something before writing it. This is just going to go inside the file, just uh, above where the code would eventually go. But at the moment, it just acts as a placeholder. And as you can see, I've sort of given a function a name, said it's a function, here's a description, and here's a parameter and an example. This is JS.toolkit's notation. And it's good because there's a program there which will take this and uh, it'll read it and let you spit out documentation sites like this. And it's a full templating language. It's written in JavaScript, so if you're writing JavaScript, you can hack around with, with the thing. And if you've got some design skill, then you can do much better than, than this or I did. Um, you can add your own tags. So if you've got a particular uh, idea you want to get across, like I've got full API writing plugins and writing tests along the top, that's nothing standard JavaScript. I was able to add my own tags to, to be able to sort uh, parts of the API into those categories. So yep, we've documented the, the name. And we've also got an example at the bottom. And that's very important, because uh, writing an example, it's like you're using your code before it's actually written. And, and it's surprising how many times you can start writing it and think, oh, this actually feels really bad. And catching that at that point is really important, because you haven't wasted months and months of effort uh, actually implementing it. If we're going to write a plugin for jQuery, the documentation will be slightly different. Here I've got a jQuery hash carousel. That's saying it's an instance method. Um, on the jQuery object because it goes on dot .prototype. And we don't have a parameter because it just acts on the jQuery object itself. You've already done the dollar select a bit. I use a language here like um, turn each element in the set of matched elements into a carousel. And that kind of language is deliberate because if you look at the jQuery documentation itself, it uses the same language. So get a value of an attribute for the first element in the set of matched elements before each element in the set of matched elements. This kind of uh, consistency, that, that scores you loads of points with the big man. If you're working in a team, this is the point to send, uh, send your API around for, for analysis, for, for, to get them to test it. Because you're less likely to hear criticism when you've spent a long time writing the code. But at this point, you're, you're more likely to, to hear ideas that maybe something doesn't work or another idea might be better. But it's very important that we name functions and parameters consistently. I knew consistency was going to be a big part of this uh, presentation, so I, I did quite a lot of research into it. Well, I say research. I just looked it up on Wikipedia like anyone else would do. I was very surprised to see that it just said, not PHP. <laughs> so I went for a little look at PHP's string functions to see what all the fuss was about. I mean, it seemed sensible, uh, string to lower. Yeah, that makes sense. And then some of the methods, they, oh, they've introduced underscores. They didn't have underscores before. But at least it's still got str at the start. Oh, OK, we've ditched that now. We've got string at the end. But we've still got the underscores. And then some methods were just a hilarious sort of mixture of every style that they could uh, find in the API. Do you think Patrick Stewart likes PHP? No, he does not. <laughs> For balance, I should say that the, the documentation in PHP is, is actually quite good, so better than a, a lot of other frameworks. It is just a shame that the rest of the language is like being wrapped in barbed wire and being kicked down the stairs. It's 
very unpleasant experience. So thinking of our requirements, we, we want to add an option. D does the carousel loop or, or does it not? We also want to specify how long it takes for the carousel to move from item to item, because uh, this is what we ha heard from the designers. You know, on like the Garden Watch website, things should move slowly. Uh, on, on Team website, they might move faster. Something about fast objects scaring old people. I didn't quite understand it myself, but we, we wanted an option for that. So we added them in. So we got a parameter there for loop. It's false by default, that's cool, so you don't always have to, to, to add it. And same for duration as well, and that's in, in milliseconds. But if we look at our example in isolation, whatever, true, 500, our code is no longer readable. You'd need to read the documentation to know what that meant. So try and make your arguments read well, try and make them sort of tell a story. If we look at this bit of jQuery, it's brilliant. So here's this thing which is obviously a bit of HTML, append it to this thing which is obviously a CSS selector. Excellent. This one, which I just made up, dot size and then two numbers. But convention tells us that when we're dealing with uh, dimensions, size will be width and height in that order. So that, that works as well. Something like this, which is from the, um, the DOM spec, so clone node true. And when you see that code, unless you know already, unless you've already read the documentation, you're like, well, well what does true do? What, what if it's false? Does it not clone the node? You know, you, you have to go back to the documentation and find out. Our arch enemy when it comes to readable code is regular expressions. It looks like my granddad trying to exit Vim, you know? <laughs> regular expressions, they aren't even readable by the person who wrote them, and that's, uh, ideally we want our code to be readable and editable by, by anyone. So what can we do about this? Well, oh, we, we do actually have another problem here as well, actually, because uh, what if we only wanted to set the duration? What if, if we were happy with the other parameters in the middle? You would end up having to put something like undefined or null in the middle there. So you have to skip over the parameter. And now we've got a Boolean with three possible values, and, and that doesn't work at all. A big offender in this respect is Swift object. If you've ever seen that, you end up with loads and loads of parameters. And if you want to get to the, the one at the end, you have undefined, 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 undefined. And you're sort of counting how many it is to get to the one you want. So that's not great. Use option objects for optional arguments to get around this. So instead of this, we'd have this. It's, it's an object, so you can put one or the other, both or neither. And, and because they have a, a label at the start, it, t it tells a story. We, we now know what 500 means, it's duration uh, and loop uh, for the Boolean. Just make sure you document uh, these objects, these option objects. I see too much code that's documented like this, where the second parameter is just options. So I'll thank you very much. I'll be going to look at the code now. JSDoc Toolkit lets you do this. And I think the reason why a lot of people don't is, is because uh, their documentation system doesn't support uh, documenting option objects. JSDoc Toolkit does it like this. So we've got ops.loop, it's false by default, and ops.duration. So what other options did we add? So we've got this already, looping and duration. We also added one called spotlight size. And that was a real tough one to name. It's, the kind of, it's like the number of items in the middle. So this has a spotlight size of, of two. Uh, so, which is the, as many as it can display in that space. But you can also say, I want a spotlight size of one. And that would be just in the middle. We chose spotlight because it, it's a difficult concept to explain. It's not item count, because we're not changing the number of items in the carousel. It's not view size, because it, it remains the same width in total. So we use this metaphor, we use a stage metaphor. The stage can be one size, but the spotlight can just be on a, a section of it. So here we've got three items on the stage, but spotlight on one of them. So use metaphors if necessary. I'd kind of treat them as a fallback, uh, but be very careful they don't mislead people. I was watching a grandparent of mine using the computer and then on their Windows desktop. All of their icons were sort of crushed to one side, all overlapping each other. And I said, why, why have you done that? Surely that's really difficult to use. And they went, ah, ah, ha, ha. I was like, oh, God, they feel like they're being clever. This means it's, it's not going to be good. Uh, well, the computer said it was low on space. So I have made some space. Um, <laughs> right, that's actually quite clever. So you know, because they've been presented with this desktop metaphor on an actual desktop, you can create space without removing anything from it, just so by stacking things up. So, and the, the desktop's actually a terrible metaphor for this, because we also have desktop wallpaper. You know, that's a horrible mix matter. Who puts wallpaper on their desktop? You know, that's when you would call them a doctor or something if you found someone doing that. So. Yeah, we, we had this code. What other options did we use? OK, so we had one called step, and that's the number of items to move uh, at, at a given time. So the default would be one, move one at a time. So yeah, that's, this is the one we saw before. But maybe we would say move two at a time. And as you can see, we've got some sort of pagination now. And because we're moving two at a time, but we have an odd number of items, we've left a gap to keep the, the, the pages in, in, in sync. 
The common cases for this, however, is either having one, move one at a time, or moving by the number of items in the spotlight. Currently, the user's going to be uh, frequently putting the same number in spotlight size as they would in step, and that's not great. We need to consider these common usages and make those things easy. We could improve this API by having a paged option uh, like this. But now we've lost the ability to have a carousel with 10 items in and moving by five at a time. So what we could do is we could retain both, so have step and paged, and, and the user can pick whichever one uh, works for them. But now we've got two options which do similar things, and, and what if they're used together? Which one has uh, priority? It makes the documents, uh, documentation really difficult to read. So try and avoid options that depend on or clash with other options. It, um, it makes the documentation really difficult to explain. You can't use this one if you use this one. To give a real-world example, CSS overflow X and overflow Y. There are combinations of these two that you're not allowed. And if we look at the specification, um, some combinations with visible are not possible. If one is specified as visible and the other is scroller auto, then visible is set to auto. You're like, what? That's just words. You know, you have to read it quite a few times to figure out what it means. And bad documentation, I can't stress enough, leads to really uncomfortable TV viewing with mummy. So think of the children. So Although we've got the, these two things, there are, one's a number and one's a boolean, and we can take advantage of that and maybe just have paged, which could be true, or it could be a number, in which case it, it, you, you've covered both bases. Page two doesn't read fantastically, and I'll admit that, but it is the edge case. We've made the common case uh, the easiest and uh, easiest for users to, to get along with. But we have catered for, uh, for the edge case, so you can have the thing with 10 items moving by five at a time. Having parameters of varying types, that's fine. It's JavaScript's good at that. But be consistent in the types um, that you use for similar things. One that really winds me up is color values in CSS. So here we've got RGB, and then we've got three numbers, three 8-bit values. We can also use percentages for relative values, and that's cool. But when alpha is introduced, it's, it's a number between 0 and 1, even though it's, it, it's an 8-bit value, the same as the rest. And that, that's kind of a bit surprising at first. You know, why? <laughs> What we should be able to do in this case is mix percentages and 8-bit eight, eight values, which we currently can't do. Uh, and that's useful because Photoshop always presents opacity as a percentage, even though it is just an 8-bit value like the rest. When, you, when you're using 32-bit colors, you get 8 bits for the, for the alpha. We've made some big decisions so far, and we, we need to make sure that we're, we're on the right tracks. We, we've looked at most of the elements we need, um, but we need to be careful that, that we haven't gone down the wrong path. We need to test our API. It's really difficult to proofread your own work. If you take a look at this image and have a, have a think about what, what it is, what it represents, maybe the bit at the bottom could look a bit like New Zealand, perhaps. If I fill it in, you can see it's uh, some sexy vampire action. It was a poster for True Blood. But if I take, take that away, that's not useful. Why is that there? This has destroyed the flow a bit. Right, OK. So if I take it away now, you can't come to that image of the same freshness you did before. You, you start looking at it, and you still see the vampires. So that's what you need. You need someone else to look at your code afresh without the, the kind of preconceptions that you have. Show, show your examples to someone else. Do they have a rough idea of, of what it does? Just the examples, and that tests the readability. And then let them read your documentation and see how they get along with that. Capture any questions they have from this, because if they've got questions, it's probably things that should be in the documentation. Another person can easily spot silly mistakes as well. Uh, back home, back in Carlisle, which I've already explained is a more innocent place, uh, I saw this sign in a shop window. I thought, oh dear. <laughs> Someone obviously wrote that and thought, yep, that's a respectable way to sell a bike. <laughs> Put it in the shop window. So just showing that to someone else, or I say, what do you think of my sign to sell the bikes? And they go, I don't like it. It makes you sound like a criminal. You know, it's, you're gonna, I wouldn't want to go in your shop. Uh, OK. We've covered most of the elements in, in detail now. The, we haven't really done a lot with flexibility. We've added options to our carousel, but there's loads more, loads more we can do around that. How many times have you used a, a JavaScript component that's not quite done what you want it to do, and you can't change it to do that little bit extra or that little bit different? What can we do about that? Well, first, resign yourself to the idea that what you make will never do everything the user wants. You can't just keep adding options, hoping to, uh, to cater for everything. So we have this sorted at the moment. Yeah, the looping, et cetera, as well. But what if the user wanted to make this? So it's only got a forward button. There's no back button. And the, the image is huge. And the labels kind of sit over the top and, and fade out. 
But the hard work is common. We've still got the moving things around, hiding it, the same accessibility requirements will be represented in the same way. The user would currently have to really fight the implementation to get something like this. So how can we, how can we add this flexibility? Well, build something more abstract uh, that you would inherit from yourself, but that the user can all already, that they can use as well. A bit more effort, but they can change the design. They, they get a lot more freedom with it. But in our case, a carousel which would just move the images around, it wouldn't have the buttons. So we would have our, our carousel, and we call this more abstract thing, we call it carousel pane. Uh, we call it carousel pane because it's like a window pane that you're looking through, which I guess is mixing the metaphors of the stage thing. But, uh, uh, and we thought we were very clever as well because it was the painful bits of the implementation. Ho, 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 never mind. <laughs> but there's no code duplication because the carousel itself inherits from carousel pane. It uses the, it, it uses the same interface and it just, just adds to it. So if the user wanted to, to, to create a carousel like we saw before, yeah, they would use carousel pane. And, and that gives you more freedom, but there's more setup, a little bit more effort. But by keeping the, the main carousel with the design that's already there, that, that, um, that makes things really easy to set up. It kind of eases the learning curve and adds the perception of progress. So if I decide I'm going to create a carousel, yeah, I base it on uh, carousel. And in one line of code, it's working on a page. One line of code. And I can play around with it and think, well, that's pretty good but I need to add these options to make it do exactly what I want. And then at the stage you go, oh, but there isn't an option for this. And you can swap it out and inherit from Carousel Pane instead and just change the navigation to be, to be how you want it to be. And it slowly introduces the user to the features. This technique doesn't, is not just for UI components. jQuery uses it. They've got .get, a file name and a function. But they also have another method called .ajax. And that's doing exactly the same thing um, but a little bit more code. But there's more power in .ajax because you can add like error methods, you can add you know, timeouts and, uh, and loads of other stuff. It's, it's one of the biggest documentation pages in, in jQuery. So uh, back, to the, back to the carousel. How did, we, how did we make this work? So we used instances. So the code for making the, the carousel pane currently like this, but this gives us a, a, an instance out. So we've changed the, the carousel pane to start with a capital letter, which kind of shows that it's a constructor. And we just spat this object out the, out the end. And we now call something like .move to on that. So although our carousel doesn't have any buttons, we can still make it work. And we could call that method, say, when they click a button on the page. So we can, we can create lots of buttons that do the same thing. We can uh, design them exactly how, uh, how we want. And it could chain as well. So we could have another method, like get me the items that are visible now, and uh, change their text color to red. So. That's the traditional JavaScript way of doing it. jQuery UI, it's slightly different. jQuery UI doesn't give you an instance. It only gives you an instance of the jQuery object. Is it, that bit of code would be exactly the same, uh, return exactly the same as this bit of code. So how do we tell the carousel to do something? Well, the convention tends to be you'll do, uh, you call carousel pane again, and then pass in as a string the command you want it to do, and then the rest of the parameters. Chaining would work as before. But there's this kind of feeling of repetition, you know, carousel.carousel pane, dot carousel pane. And that's also because it's really difficult to name the variable dollar carousel, um, because it's not a carousel. It's the element with which we created the carousel from. It's, it's quite, quite difficult to think about. Also, some of the normal methods stop working. If we create a, a jQuery UI dialog, we can call dot bind, the normal jQuery method for adding event listeners. But we can't call show and hide, because that, sh that hides the elements rather than the dialog. Instead, we have to call dialog dot dialog open and, and close. And if you misspell one of those, it just it does nothing. It's a silent failure, and, and that's a problem. In normal JavaScript, you would get undefined is not a function, and it would tell you exactly the line number you went wrong. I'm sure you can tell that I, I personally, I prefer instances. I like having little variables with discrete bits of functionality that are separate from the jQuery instances. Uh, I want a carousel instance, which is just dedicated to doing the carousel stuff. So maybe I should create a, a, a jQuery UI plugin, which returns instances. No, I shouldn't, because that's, that's completely inconsistent. Anyone who's used to using jQuery UI, they're used to this slightly broken pattern. What I should do is just be like jQuery UI if I'm working in jQuery UI space. <laughs> it's the same as the tube door example. You may think it's better, but it's, but it's not. It's just it's too different. So I'm going to rattle through this. Little bits of more flexibility we can add. Uh, you might have a feature request, and someone says, hey, I've, I've built a carousel like this. Um, but what I want to do is I, I want to have the label sort of sitting at the bottom, and I want them to fade out uh, and slide in. Your carousel doesn't let me do that. Can you add me some options? Uh, yeah, OK, fair enough. Uh, we'll add you an option. Tell me where your labels are, because we don't know that yet. And tell me how you'd like to have them animate in and out. Uh, so we're just going to get option bloat. We, you can't just keep adding options like that. Too few options is a bad thing, but you need to know when enough is enough, when you've achieved everything you can in, in, in that domain. 
don't get yourself into option hell. Uh, we could point them in the direction of carousel pane. Hey, go and build it yourself with our abstract widget. Um, but what they're doing is just very slightly different um, from our normal carousel, the really easy to use one. It has the same back and forward buttons. So break the request down into components. So we've got our carousel, and what they want is when it starts moving, fade the labels out. When it stops moving, slide them in. It's this sort of fading and sliding thing that we, we don't really want to do that. That's too specific. Instead, we want them to do something at that point. And it's very clear that it's when carousel. We want to tell the user when the carousel does something and let them act, let them do whatever they want. So it's clear from this that we're, we're wanting some kind of event system. Staying with our constructor inheritance pattern. So here's a, um, we've got our carousel. Uh, how do we add an event listener? Well, there'll be a method for that, like dot on, move, and then uh, log out hello. And now in the carousel, um, to get the, uh, the dot on method, you would normally inherit from something else. Uh, in the case of UE, there's a, an object called event target that you can in inherit from. Node.js has event emitter. Uh, Flash has one as well. They call it event dispatcher. So there's a, a lot of frameworks will have this already built in. So now when I call um, something like dot move by one, it will log hello because it will call that listener function. And to fire that event in our own methods, there will be a method called like dot fire, and we just pass in the name of the event that we want to fire. In some frameworks, it's dot trigger, but it essentially does the same thing. I'm going to skip, skip the jQuery stuff because I'm overrunning. So, but fire lots of events. Fire events before an action happens. And like when you click on a link or click on a button on a carousel, tell, tell the user, let them do something. Even let them cancel the event, say, OK, the user's told the carousel to move, but don't do that. Do something else instead. And then fire events after asynchronous actions. So if you're waiting for the loading of images, you can fire an event to say, the images have loaded. And that will happen sometime later. And document them. This uh, jQuery um, uh, JS doc toolkit, they let you document events. It looks like this. You can say, OK, uh, my event is move, and what will be passed into the event, this event object, and it will tell you where it's moving from and to. So with those events, we can give the user what they want. So uh, on move, fade out. After move, slide the labels in. It's, yeah, it's exactly what the user wanted, but we haven't had to write it for them. So I'm overrunning slightly, but to, to wrap up, Consider the users. Uh, they're the ones going to be using your code. If you want your code to be re reusable, consider how they're going to use it. Make things easier by writing documentation uh, before implementation. Adopt existing uh, conventions where relevant. Ensure, ensure the naming of methods, properties, and parameters. Make sure that reads well. Let your code tell a story. Use option objects for optional parameters. Don't, let you, don't make users skip over other parameters to get to the one that they really want. Aim for a one line, one parameter usage of, of your UI widget or your helper method or whatever. But allow the user to write more, to get more. Let it be a sort of progressive experience. And that, use things like events and, and abstractions to help the user get creative with your code. It's really satisfying when you see people using your code for things that you didn't possibly imagine. And by doing all this, we cover the elements and we, we become uh, captain of adequately reusable JavaScript. And that's it. Um, if you want to email me any questions, I'll be around after here. But you can email me at Jake at Lanyard. I'm on uh, the Twitters as well. JS.Toolkit wasn't written by me, even though I'm uh, really bigging it up. It was written by uh, someone I ended up working with, but we were using JS.Toolkit anyway. And that's on there. He's working on a new version on GitHub. So if you're interested in it, go and help him out, because it's a great project. Uh, and my slides, they will be online very shortly uh, via Lanyard and, and on SlideShare as well. But thank you very much. Bye. Thanks.